remember this is the first long surah right after the hijra a surah that handled nothing short of the position of Muslims the trajectory of Muslims right after the establishment of a polity right after Mithaq and Medina the so-called constitution of Medina that is negotiated and written unfortunately we don't have a copy of the Mithaq that survived a, a copy that goes back 1400 years we have just reports or what survived are copies of the original copy and with different different manuscripts having slightly different terms reported but anyway so but after the Mithaq there notice Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah now handles the first critical issue and the mithaqillah that the the Allah's covenant and who bears Allah's covenant and it takes us back first in rebutting and challenging the idea that Allah's covenant is held ethnically, racially, or as a matter of entitlement. And it challenges the Israelite belief that they are the bearers of Allah's covenant and thus Allah's chosen people. But in doing so, it challenges the idea of a chosen people altogether. And then takes you back to the allegory of Adam and Eve and that placing of responsibility underscoring the the underscoring that what the, the element of choice and volition and capacity to understand which which is going to become of course this notion of capacity which sort of underscores the theme of human responsibility and the theme of volition and the theme of choice as justifying even what Allah knows will happen and that Allah knows that human beings will choose what is wrong and because they will choose what is wrong they will do and commit a lot of evil if sad for art but yet at a deep philosophical level the miracle of volition itself the miracle of choice and as Ghazali says, it's partaking of something in divinity. Because it's only the divine that actually has that power. Justifies the symbolic act of prostration. You know, not because Allah wants angels or shaitan or, or, or whatever, or angels and jinn to worship Adam. But the, the symbol of honoring the 
covenant and the inheritance and this issue, ultimate issue of choice. Then Surah Al-Baqarah takes you to a close narrative about those who were a living example of people who handled the covenant and interacted with the covenant. And in doing so, it also passes through Ibrahim as where the 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 patriarch or the father of Tawheed. Why, in part, to tell Israelites, you claim effectively moral ownership of the legacy of Ibrahim, but the legacy of Ibrahim is not yours. The legacy of Ibrahim belongs to Tawheed. That is what it was all about. And it's not about a chosen people, and it's not about a, a, a historical legacy. It's not about the story of a, a, a particular dy historical dynamic that took place in the past. It is about the principle of the Tawheed itself. And then in addressing this the 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 example of the Israelites, which the Surah Al Baqarah addresses with layers of complexity, because on the one hand it talks about those who received a command to fight and didn't want to fight or those who were liberated and preferred oppression and wanted to go back to their oppressors because they preferred luxury or they preferred um, comforts of life. It talks about those who received, who related to the law in a very pedantic and myopic way, wanting the law to be about clear-cut details and losing sight of the basic principle. It takes you to the whole a, a layered narrative to those who violate clear specific commands, the Sabbath in this case, and as a result Allah abandons them themselves and as the Quran describes it they become as if apes meaning that they live for their own pleasures, and that's it, they're like animals. Um, and it, so, and it takes you to in, an example of uh, the, the Israelites actually f fighting successfully in the story of um, uh, David and his, um, uh, his defeat of Jalut. And an example at the same time of the type of sacrifice and discipline that is required in the story of the, uh, the river and drinking from the river as on the path to, to battle uh, and so on. And in this, in this narrative, what you are seeing is like a narrative about the struggle, life, and its struggles itself. Because when you look at this narrative, and you will find that there are pharaohs everywhere, and there are those who defy, who, those who submit to the pharaohs everywhere. There are those who def want to defy the pharaoh. There are those who will have an opportunity to be liberated, but will choose not to be liberated. There, you will have those who will lose sight of what God's covenant is about and make it about a particular historical struggle 
or a particular ethnic group or a particular racial group, you will have all of these are parallels that you can find yourselves in. You know, there isn't just one pharaoh, but there are pharaohs of every every age. There isn't just one David, but there is a David of every age. There isn't just one Jalut, there is a Jalut in every age. There are those that Allah appoints as kings, and they are oppressors, and deserve to be resisted in every age. Okay. In this Surah al hayat in this constant struggles of life, Surah Al-Baqarah underscores time and again that there are if if underlying foundational uh, uh, anchoring principles. Allah is close. Allah is always close. You go astray when you lose sight that Allah is ever present. And that Allah is always with you. But that Allah is always close and that it is about, always about your relationship to Allah and with Allah. Time and time again, Surah Al-Baqarah takes us to this, it's like saying, nothing will work if you lose sight of this. Now, and notice, as we've talked about, that part of the Ezraelite narrative is to also talk about those who tujar kalam or those who um, are you know they, they they are merchants or manipulators of words of talk of the 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 um, the way that speech itself can be manipulated and that although the essence of the covenant relies on the word, the most dangerous things that happens to the word, and it, 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 when the word becomes trapped and cheapened by those who trap it, because the word becomes meaningless. Then, part of this, Surah Al-Baqarah focuses on this element of duality that you find consistently among those who cheapen the word. And that is the role of what the Quran calls Al-Munafiqun, the, the hypocrites. Those who can speak charismatically, can speak beautifully, but ultimately, when you look at their moral behavior, or can, in fact, sell people upon to, to accept injustice, to accept what is wrong, to accept what is immoral. And that the dangerous role of the, the manipulators of 
truth and the manipulators of speech. Then Surah Al-Baqarah then takes you through a number of moral themes that it underscores. So it talks about a dhulm, injustice, and that it is never the case that the unjust can be described as part of God's covenant. Injustice and God's covenant cannot mix. And talks about the sharaha or tama or greed and materialism and the tendency to value things or to measure all things by um, selfish standards and standards of me and me alone as an egocentric paradigm. It talks about a qulub al-qasiyah or a, a cruelty and hearts that no longer can respond to the call of the divine or the call of morality and uh, the, the danger from, that comes from when this uh, cruelty of the heart or the, the hardness of the heart sets in. Okay. Then it emphasizes to Muslims that this moral path, be aware that this moral path ultimately clearly understands that God and to God alone is judgment and that the practice of claiming that as Christians claim that you know heaven is for them alone or Jews claim that heaven is for them alone is not the Muslim way the Muslim way is doing what is morally right and saying and accepting that God is meticulously just and is, and is unjust to no one. And understanding the limits of what human beings have competency over. Then After having given the examples of the way that the the, the, the examples of the, where of the past, using the Israelites as the main example, then there is the Quran, the Surah Al-Baqarah is going to respond to a series of issues that came up to in Medina responses that are prescriptive that will say do this or do not do this but before doing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that it is not about the mechanics that yes there will be prescriptive commands but understand that it is not about, as the Quran puts it, a qibla or the direction that that wherever you direct your face, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again a reminder that law or at, or at least readying the receiver to understand that it is 
finding the a, the path in life is not about the technicalities of al busala or the compass. That yes, we have the technicalities of how we face Mecca, but this is not what it's about. Having then laid that foundation, the Quran, the Surah Al-Baqarah proceeds to address a number of issues in response to actual questions that have come up, whether relating to prayer, relating to Hajj, relating to Safa al-Marwa, relating to the principle of punishment, relating to marriage and divorce, the rights of divorcees, the rights of widows, the rights of for support and maintenance, and eventually debt and contracts. But the trajectory in all of these, I would submit to you that if you study these laws carefully, the trajectory in all of these is something that if you, if you have any reasonable moral foundation, if you if you've have even a basic understanding of morality, you would find that the trajectory of all of these laws was the protection of the unprotected and the empowerment of the disempowered, not in absolute and ideal terms but in relational terms that a problem came up how can I create achieve greater equity greater fairness within the circumstances possible if you talk about equity in absolute terms Regardless of the facts on the ground, equity can very quickly turn into either provisions of law that are meaningless, that people just completely ignore them, as if done with women witnessing, for instance, or in fact, idealized law often produces precisely the opposite. Often when people look at institutions of law or the sociology of law, they ask the question, why is it that judges or lawyers or legal practice, even comparative legal sociology, um, why is it that they, that they often work in such incremental terms and avoid philosophical purity or things that are philosophically pure and the reason is is that when you are trying to achieve actual results on the ground that lead to greater sociological equity You cannot afford, at a legal level, philosophical purity. You can't just talk in absolute terms and achieve sociological results that are more equitable. But the mistake that Muslims often fall into is precisely the mistakes that so many nations in the past have fallen into. And that is to think, to, to, to imagine that just because the prescriptive, legal prescriptive commands have produced 
what was sociologically more equitable under a certain set of circumstances, then that's the sum to sum to total sum of the matter, or sum total of the matter. The philosophical purity is understood at a moral, ethical level, and it mu must remain as an aspiration to law, achievable in relative terms, as is possible, under different times and places. But to take talaq or inheritance or this or that and say, well, you, you know, and that doesn't mean that we just simply ignore the prescriptions and because then we're ignoring the, the, the educational process that Allah sent to us. Allah sent us this so that we can study it to educate ourselves as to the mechanics of reform. And so here, what is critical in this dynamic are these moral foundations that Allah sets for us as ultimate aspirational goals that everything the way we relate to the covenant the way we relate to the principle of taklif of obligation and and this is a very big statement by the way the way that we relate to volition and choice the way that we relate ultimately to the very epistemology, the system of knowledge, of learning from the legal applications, is always informed and shaped by these underlying foundations that Allah sets for us. So, what is anchored is this revolutionary idea that you are Ummatul Wasat. And as we said, Ummatul Wasat, the nation, the medium, is always relational. So you, to, to under, always understand, it's like saying to you, what I expect from you is to do what is reasonable. Well, if you are a jerk, you'd say reasonable. What does that mean? I'm just going to ignore this advice. I'm not going to learn anything from it. But if you want to, if you're not a jerk, you say reasonable. Okay, well, I cannot be reasonable unless I am also relational. Because reasonability cannot be defined in absolute terms. It always has to be defined in terms of what the parameters are. So when Allah says that you are Ummatul Wasat and not just Ummatul Wasat just so we can come to Allah and say, look, we were Wasat, but that you have you you this is tied into an obligation that you are to witness upon humanity, then Allah has challenged you to be at the forefront of the moral arc of reasonability. At the forefront of the moral arc of reasonability. Within this is, as we talked about, the extensive discussions about khair and adl and fadl. Goodness, justice, and fadl, benevolence. 
what is, or as many have said, the al-fadl wal ihsan shay'un wahid, that they're the same thing, that the, the benevolence and, and goodness is to go beyond justice. And Allah underscores the role of the kitab as guidance and hikmah as guidance. And we've talked about that. Hikmah, wisdom as guidance. And Allah underscores in this the entire teaching about thinking that there are any instrumentalities that fast track your relation to uh, relationship to Allah or mediate your relationship to Allah for you like law or like institutions of power that's shafa that we talked about and Allah underscoring that remember in understanding or in as, as this moral foundation that dhulm not just dhulm but injustice but taghut oppression and as we said tughyan is to go beyond what each deserves according to the right are inconsistent with Allah's covenant and with whatever the instrumentalities that Allah has given you as you as you think through applying them and as in 188 Allah reminds us, blindly surrendering to the hukam, that blindly just saying, well, we surrender our affairs to those in charge. Let them guide us. That your active part is, what, what is the, when you study the seerah and the, the story of the companions of the Prophet and the and, and, what is the thing that strikes you the most about the so-called golden age, the, uh, the Khulafa or Rashidun? Is that people took an actual personal interest in the affairs of everything. People were actually personally involved. The idea of telling people, just trust us. Now, it is naive and childish to think that the instrumentalities that were appropriate to achieve this 1400 years ago like a woman standing in the mosque telling Omar you're wrong when Omar wanted to put a limit on uh, how, how much women can ask for a dowry that this is appropriate for our age the challenge is for our age to come up with instrumentalities that achieve the same thing Yes, we, we, we can't guarantee that the, war, the person in, uh, who's ruling is going to be a, a, a Omar who reacts very humbly to a woman reprimanding him. But so what instrumentalities are you going to put in place? That, that's really achieving God's covenant. Not sitting on our behinds and saying, well, you know, لله mulk Allah just it's all up to Allah and we just, that that's not bearing the covenant and don't forget the most critical element repeated in surah al-baqarah and it will come back again in surah al-umran by the way but in Surah Al-Baqarah in 177 and in 188, Al-Birr, that, that, that key concept that has been completely ignored by modern Muslims, 
that El Bir is, as you recall, from 177-189, sorry, we spoke, 177-189, that it is your Salah, it is your Iman, but it is in relationship to material things. It is taking responsibility for those that are of an immediate charge, but also taking responsibility like your relatives, but also taking responsibility for the disempowered, the masakin, waliyatama, wabna sabil the displaced, the orphans, and so on. And that you spend from what you love, and that you do that you understand that they are not less than you in worth. So that if you relate to them in any way, but remember that part of al birr is the key element of dignity. That in giving, you cannot injure their dignity. And if you're going to injure their dignity, then it's better not to give. And a remarkable moral foundation when Allah says, that this path, this dynamic, is, as we said when we talk, it's like we said, it is the searching for nirvana. Oppression, injustice, need, are inconsistent with that spiritual state. A person who learns to be scared will learn hypocrisy. And if you learn hypocrisy, you learn to lie. And it, the idea of silm becomes impossibly elusive. Or like, as we see in the modern age, you oppress people by telling them, if you express an opinion, I will throw you in prison forever. But I will make you happy by bringing in rappers and naked people and, you know, everything that will distract you. That's not sin. That's not sin. Remember what we said about what Sheikh Muhammad Abdul says that if only Muslims understood the narrative of Surah Al-Baqarah, especially a particular passage that we talked about, that they would, the idea of despotism would have never been allowed to take root in Muslim societies. And of course, this is a clear, the whole context and discourse uh, in La Ikraha Fiddin, that the idea of coercion itself is a moral problem. Because coercive societies, coercive societies, societies that rely on the instrumentality of law and the threat of punishment, either the actual punishment or the threat of punishment, to obtain people's consent rather than persuasion, are societies in which immorality will sprout under darkness. People learn 
to conceal what is there in their hearts, to do what is wrong, but in absolute darkness, and to become morally meek and irresponsible. And then it is then taking you to this, as I said, re remarkably tender closing of saying this is about a moral path rising to the responsibility of the covenant not being God's chosen people because there are no God's chosen people but being God's people not because you're entitled but because you are morally in fact the embodiment of God's people but this path you must understand that you will not achieve it not just through you cannot achieve it through coercion but you cannot even achieve it if you are ignoring the nature of people and ignoring the sociology of people and ignoring the psychology of people by asking people to bear what they cannot. Now, it's, it's here, remember the standard of reasonability again, when I say be reasonable. It's different because Allah doesn't tell us how to exactly strike that balance. Strike the balance between being morally upright and not, not using ease or not burdening people as an excuse to do what is immoral. It's a, it's a very difficult balance. And that's precisely what hikmah is. How are you going to strike that balance? That requires an enormous amount of wisdom. Meaning an enormous amount in modern language, an enormous amount of education. In order to and, and it cannot be struck by one person. It is, we can't forget what the Quran has taught us about Shura and about the fact that we need to be able to have a situation where we're not like the pharaohs, but where if people are starting to lean towards the wrong path, they can be corrected by their sisters and brothers. So it, it, if, if, the, if the atmosphere is oppressive and suffocating, then the chances that you can actually strike that battle, it becomes far more elusive and far more difficult. So it is not an exaggeration to say that Surah Al-Baqarah in its first revelation took Muslims it's towards an entire their entire attitude towards life. Because if you find if you search on Surah Al Baqarah, you will if you read through it enough times, you will find it so at different parts it bespeaks a parallel to something you've experienced in life. And you will say, oh, I've experienced this, depending on when you read it in your life. Uh, oh, I felt this. Morality and law. Morality and law. The toughest challenges that confront 
that have confronted human beings ever since human beings have become literate enough to articulate these two concepts, although I suspect they've always innately felt them. Um, how do we strike that balance? And that's what Surah Al-Baqarah is about. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Okay, I'm going to call it. And Alhamdulillah, we finished Surah Al-Baqarah.